Hello, my name is Davr Orsolic. I'm a research assistant at Roger Borskovich Institute and I'm going to talk about prediction of drug kinase binding affinities with focus on conserved protein kinase domain. We got introduced to this topic when applied to the IDG DREAM drug kinase binding prediction challenge, dealing with large-scale binding affinity predictions where they tried to address several questions regarding optimal computational approaches and bioactivity assays for maximal prediction accuracy. After the challenge was over, we continued to work on this problem, since protein kinases are the subject of many research papers, and there are a number of studies achieving very good results on benchmark datasets such as Davis, Metz, and Kiba, but are very limited when wanting to apply them on real case scenarios. Simple tests on different difficulty test settings, as introduced by some authors, imply that major reason behind it is the vastness of compound scaffold space that is not nearly represented in benchmark datasets. So for further research, we used the Davis dataset comprising 68 compounds and around 400 kinases and extended the compound space by including experimentally measured binding affinities across multiple resources, such as Campbell, BindingDB and drug target comments. Collected data, as it is shown on the finger on the left, uh, was filtered to include only small compounds, human kinome target space, and bioactivity profiles expressed as dissociation and inhibition constants, KD and KI, respectively. For the purpose of increasing the binding affinity landscape, we treat the KD and KI as interchangeable. One disadvantage that remains before and after we extend the data is huge imbalance in what we consider active and inactive interactions, uh, or binding affinities uh, PKD or PKI of, of 7 units and those above or equal to 7 units as can be seen on a density plot. To get a better feeling for a compound space, the, the similarity matrix based on Morgan fingerprints was used as the input for TSNI analysis. Several clusters became apparent with a middle cloud of uh, not well separated compounds. As can be seen on the left plot, 68 compounds from Davis are shown in red and the rest of the compound space collected from other resources are shown in blue. By doing so, we enriched the compound space already covered by Davis examples and added a variety of compound scaffolds that are grouped on the periphery with well-defined clusters. Uh, on the other hand, concerning target space, taking into consideration the protein structure of this whole protein family, we performed local alignment on only highly conserved protein kinase domain sequences. As we know, the majority of kinase inhibitors in our dataset and kinase inhibitors in general bind in the ATP binding pocket or somewhere in its proximity with multiple smaller pockets being well defined in the literature. All of these are stationed within a highly conserved protein kinase domain. So we reduced these sequences to contain only those con conserved regions. To test if such representation will improve our ability to differentiate between kinase groups, once again TSNI analysis was performed, and figure above shows the TSNI analysis of a whole protein sequence, while in comparison figure below shows TSNI performed using only conserved domains. We can see that most of the groups are very well separated from each other uh, in the two-dimensional space, with exclusion of two kinase groups, atypical and other. Here we see a comparison of two of our approaches with a baseline approach. We trained a deep learning network with compounds represented as graphs, similar to the graph DTA method, and kinases as protein kinase domain sequences. And in contrast, we also trained a simpler model, XGBoost, where compounds were represented as similarities based on Morgan fingerprints with radii of 1 and targets as the main sequence local similarities. Comparing only on the first test setting, baseline outperforms both of our approaches. But when comparing on more rigorous settings, uh, such as test setting 2 and 3, we see a huge difference in both GCN and XGBoost approaches, where the baseline model shows almost random behavior, which is the case especially for the setting 2, with that indicates the important impact of exposure to large compound space during the training phase, with both of our approaches being better when it's necessary to generalize over new compound scaffolds and new kinase targets. 
Here's the same testing plot for compound spins of over 6,000 training compounds, which was the first step in defining an applicability domain. Defining limits compound space. Due to size, many compounds overlap, so the yellow lines represent the density of certain areas that are not otherwise obvious, and blue hexagons represent the count of experimentally measured binding affinities per every compound in the training set. Same is true for both pictures. On the left, we see the setting two test compounds, color-coded in green, orange, and red, and casted over the training compound space. Those three levels were defined due to the fact that experimental bioactivity assays performed with different methods or by different labs can vary 1-2 to two units on average. What these graphs tell us is that, for example, in setting two test set, most of the compounds located in highly dense areas, such as surrounding clusters, have low mean error rates in comparison to larger scalar compounds in the low-density cloud in the middle. For setting 3 test set is a somewhat different situation where, regardless of density, we have two small clusters, one with low mean error rates and the other with high mean error rates, and the rest seem to be randomly scattered. And this scenario might imply that defining boundaries of applicability domain only from a compound perspective might not give us the whole picture to assess the confidence of our predictions. Next step here would be to integrate both target and compound information to inform a two-view perspective when quantifying model performance over all three test setting difficulty levels. Thank you for your time.